Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Now, I told you on my previous upload that I was going to be doing something else in Paducah. And what better thing to do on a rainy day than to come to an amazing stop that you can get some more brain wrinkles. So that's what we're doing today. So today we are at the River Discovery Center right across from the historic, beautiful flood walls. And we are going to go exploring. Now, I've gotten the lay of the land already, so we're going to be working our way through. And then we'll be coming back to the gift shop because I've got my eye on a couple of things. But you're coming with me. Let's go. Now, as we travel around the museum, you're going to find some super cool things for Junior Ranger Program. In fact, they have a really nice educational stop here. So if you have the kiddos with you, they're going to love this spot. Now, again, tons of Junior Ranger things. So keep your eye out and you'll see a little bit more of these as we progress. Now, entering into the area right here. We're going to be going through a timeline. The timeline is so important because not only is it going to tie together the pieces that we saw on the large flood walls, but it's also going to give us a little bit more context as to when this all began. And as I kind of look forward, there's going to be some things that you're really going to enjoy, especially if you enjoy finding out a bit more about what makes the rivers so important to us. There's so many unique stations here. I, I can't wait for you to see them. So I'm just going to get started right here with this guy. What is this? Okay, this guy right here is actually a Mackinac, and Mackinacs were commonly used between the 1800s all the way up to the 1870s. These were barge-like crafts with blunt ends, and they replaced the original canoes that fur traders would use. These were traditionally rowed, paddled, or when conditions were suitable, they would actually use a small square sail, and they kind of looked like this when they did. So this is a really neat start to our story, and as we go forward, then then we start to see steam-powered boats enter the picture. Now, steam-powered boats joined the American fleet in 1811. And here you can see some different versions of what some of these might have looked like. But as we're kind of looking through here, you'll notice that steamboats were much larger. They were able to carry passengers and not just supplies in limited amounts. In fact, some of these could carry up to 350 tons and only have to have about 31 inches of water that they could draw. So that's a pretty spectacular number right there. Look at these though, very, very intricate. The designs of them were much different than the Mackinac. They had de various decks on here. And you saw on the back, there was a large paddle wheel. So very, very different apparatus altogether. Now, while these steamboats did originally start out as cargo carriers, they became palaces on water. In other words, they could carry lots of people in very nice conditions, which is why you started seeing more of the intricacies coming out within each one of them as they were produced. In fact, some of them could carry up to 500 people at a time. Now, now, there are several different boats that are similar to this that are still in service today. You see many of them very commonly referenced whenever you go to New Orleans or even whenever you go to certain tourist destinations that want just a cool thing to do. But the original ones had a huge purpose that was much more than just tourism. It was much, much more. At this next stop, we actually have something we can listen to right here. So you will touch to play and then just take a moment to enjoy what's next. Music is playing overhead and uh, we're going to listen to it and then I'll get back to you. Now the song that we just heard was actually something that was brought back. Uh, in fact, Dylan Buston who had visited the area and gone along some of the river communities, had gathered up all of these songs that were sang in reference, and he created these recordings so that people could hear these songs. And the song itself 
definitely was very cool. It made references to the river numerous times because the river was such a big thing, you know, just like everything else. People are inspired by things. And so that was really neat. And you, you can hear the music overhead through this speaker. So definitely check it out and listen to that one. Now, something else I noticed while we were kind of listening to the song were all of these amazing photos of different kinds of boats that might have been going down the river. Now, we saw this guy while ago. This was cool, right? But did you know also that they had ironclads and gunboats and things like that that would use this river passage to get from point A to point B? In fact, we saw on the murals the other day that there were fortresses kind of built out to protect certain areas. And so it, it only makes sense that also they would have gunboats. These gunboats looked crazy and it's like something medieval they were just like a fortress on the water and let me let me just show you some of these amazing ships including these gunboats Now, in addition to those photos, we see more and more models kind of around this first room. And these models are all very unique and each one of them has something telling you a little bit more about them within the case. And for example, this is the MV Ray Eckstein. It was built in 1973 by Nashville Bridge Company for Wisconsin Barge Line of Cassville, Wisconsin. Then it was named after Ray Eckstein its president. It was actually an 8,400 horsepower and it was massive. In fact, it stood 195 feet, 50 feet by 11 and a half feet. And it was powered by three 16, 645 diesel turning 10 inch wheels. It just shows that these boats come in all shapes and sizes and had different purposes from the gunboats and the ironclads to ships like this one. Very, very different concepts and different construction, but awesome just the same. What's always kind of baffled me is how that they first discovered that boats would in fact float even though they were so massively heavy. Now a canoe or something like that I could see it's only one person and it's a hollowed out shell but once you start adding all of these extra things it takes a lot of work to figure out how to make it actually function in a way that will be productive for the future. So it, it always baffles me when I come here and I see just the sheer size of some of these. I mean, that's just one of those question marks that I think I've always had in life. So I'm gonna get some more answers as we keep on going. Now, like many museums and learning centers that we've visited, there is actually a little bit of information here about the Trail of Tears. The Cherokee Trail of Tears is one of the saddest episodes in American history. And by the Treaty of New Okota, Ratified in 1836, the U.S. government removed all Cherokee Indians from their native homes. So how does this work into the bigger picture of the river? You might be asking. Well, actually, a portion of the Trail of Tears ran through Kentucky and actually passed over the Ohio River. So with as large as the river is, can you imagine what it would have been like to be those Native Americans. I always question those things whenever we see a display, but definitely with something like that. I mean, it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to process. And when I mean large, I mean large. Can you imagine having to go under the water in a suit like this? Now, just for some context, this is actual metal, very weighty, very heavy. And oh my goodness, I could not personally imagine having to do that like ever. But this was in fact a diving suit that was top of the line at that time. Now, of course, now things are much different. Now things are much more 
like streamlined and lighter, but at the time you had to be able to lift all of this weight and successfully navigate through the water. That would be quite a burden to say the least, but let's find out a little bit more about this guy right here. Now, according to this, the helmet alone weighed 60 pounds. And then there was a belt which weighed 80 pounds. And then you got down to the shoes and they were an additional 40 pounds. So on top of your regular body weight, you would be lugging around all of that weight. And then you would also be having to wear gloves, a rubberized canvas garment, and also your oxygen supply. That is a lot. So in many cases, this would more than double a person's body weight. And things were not self-contained like they are now with current scuba gear. This, this guy, this was an air pump that would then supply your oxygen down into your very heavy suit. So you would not be able to do this likely by yourself you would have to have somebody who is helping you not only with probably getting dressed but also with this part of the apparatus and believe it or not this was the tip top of technology at that time and this was what our very own military used what? Now on this wall we learn a little bit more about the Mississippi River drainage basin and what all goes into making the Mississippi the mighty Mississippi. So we have a star right here that shows that we are in Paducah and you'll see all of the different waterways that actually come into the Paducah area and here is the Ohio which we just checked out. Now the Ohio ends up going into the Mississippi, but it is not alone. As you can see, there are other tributaries here like the Cumberland and the Tennessee, and all of those are relatively big in their own right, but nothing in compared to the mighty Mississippi's massiveness. And of course, we know that the Mississippi goes all the way down and empties into the Gulf of Mexico. So this is one of the biggest ports in the entire country down here. But along the way, there are other ports that feed into that all along through here and all the way up to the very tip top of the United States. Now along these ports, this is where different industries are able to put things on barges and move them down in a variety of different ways like we saw right here in Paducah. Okay, so let's talk about how this works. For example, let's say you have a company that has candy and you need to move it to lots of people in lots of places. The best way for you to do this is to get a truck and to package it and put it onto a truck that might have a container maybe. It's going to come to a port like the one here in Paducah and it's gonna be loaded onto a barge or some kind of ship. It's then going to be put onto this and sent down the Mississippi all the way to the Gulf of Mexico where it's going to be offloaded or taken off of that and put onto a bigger ship. So it then can take that out into the largest port right here and to other countries like for example Europe they very well may make it all the way to Europe so that's kind of how that works so that's how our supply chain works on the opposite side of that though things are also coming up the Mississippi and being offloaded at all of these ports like the one here in Paducah okay guys we have another push let's see what this one is oh wow we pushed this and guess what happened? The paddle wheel started a turning over here. Now the Delta Queen, as you can see, is a big girl. In fact, at one point in time, she had 200 sleeper rooms. She was originally commissioned in 1924 and finished in 1927. She was built in Stockton, California. And, and the still work of both the Delta King and the Delta Queen, which were duplicate sister ships, came from Glasgow, Scotland. This has got to be the biggest water table I have ever seen. And this one is depicting how a series of locks and dams can really change and impact how water moves and flows, but also how it impacts industry. Let's go learn a little bit more. 
First, we check out the video, which is provided, which shows us how exactly the locks work. This is fascinating. You'll see how all of these very large barges are moving through this tiny space and the room for error is very small. Now, in reality, this is what that would look like. You'll see that there is a greater portion of water here, but that they would filter through these tiny spaces so as to be able to raise and lower the water levels so that they can get to a different tier of the water system. So for example, here you would have a larger body of water which might be a area that needs more of the strength of the water. So they need higher water. And then down here, as they're filtering through, they have a dam so that it doesn't press quite as much of this water into the lower lying areas and flood it. So this is good for flood control. However, you still have to be able to get the boats from here to here. And in water, there are no hills. So instead there are locks. A lock is a water alternative to a hill. Now by using these locks, it helps them to move industry on down the way, so to speak, but also to protect those people who are closer and closer to sea level. Because if we were to just force all the water down, what would happen is we would end up flooding out those areas. So we have to protect those areas by being able to use that series of dams. This is why we always talk about flood control being so important. Well, it's because of places like this that you're able to keep communities in areas that may not always seem logical when it comes to uh, the way that the water goes. This protects those areas. So industry can still happen as a result. Now just past the water table, there is another touch and play that goes along with this calliope. This calliope here is really, really cool. It was actually donated to the city of Paducah by George H. Aston's family. And this is really neat because this would have been on one of the original steamboats and had a really unique sound to it. So I don't know, is it going to let us play this on YouTube? We shall see. Very cool. Very, very cool. It is in this next section that we learn about the river floodplain and the wetlands. It is a very important part for many reasons. The floodplains actually slow down the surface runoff and act as a last line of defense for reducing soil and nutrient loss from the land. Now, as we move into this area, you'll notice that they have here some of the critters that might live along these areas that call it home, that need these kind of places so that they can thrive and survive. Amongst those, raccoons, beavers, newts, frogs, red-eared sliders. In fact, the river areas, in addition to the floodplain areas, create so many ecosystems for animals that we commonly see and need in our world. Sometimes things can seem like a little pest, like for example, they have a snake over here, which we're not gonna talk about because I don't like snakes, but it does serve a part of the bigger picture because we have to have both predators and prey and all of those feed into the bigger picture of what makes us be able to also function. So places like this are very wonderful because they do allow us to see a little glimpse into the secret world of all those animals and what makes them kind of need things like this and why we need to also protect them. So I think that this is a great part of this Discovery Center right here. Now we are inching closer and closer to the theater. The theater has a program that's about 15 minutes long that I'm going to sit down and watch and then I'll check back in with you in a minute. This is a pretty neat piece right here. This was one of the steamboat bells and it was actually a bell that was donated by the Badger family and the Badgett Construction Company. It was made originally at Buckeye Bell Foundry in Buckeye, Ohio. And that was in 1894. So that's super cool that this was on a steamboat once. 
Now again, on this display, you can see the dam wall, and then you can see how a little tiny bit of the main water that would be on the other side would get over to this side to create a stream that is much more controlled than what would have been coming through if all the water was just gushing down. This use of the water tables here is fascinating because it really does paint the picture of what it would be like to see this in person if you didn't get an opportunity to go out to one of the dam sites. So that's really, really neat. So this, for example, would be the mass of the water that would be coming down the pipe, so to speak, or coming naturally down this area. And here they have constructed a dam and that puts a block. So then it builds up the water here so it is a little bit deeper, but then it allows through the dam for it to filter through and it would come out through one of these little vent pipes right here. And this would allow the water to move in a more safe way down this direction so that you could actually navigate in this area but not flood this area, which is clearly much more low lying. So you see here how this one's much more flat and this one is way up here. So throughout our country, we use dams for a lot of different things. A lot of times whenever they dam up a space like this, they end up using this for either power through the dam or drinking water or sometimes both. In fact, if you're interested in finding a little bit more about this particular aspect, I encourage you guys to go watch the Hoover Dam episode that I had done previously. I learned there that hydroelectric energy is so important and it actually fuels so many of the needs of many, many people out there, not just the ones who are in the direct path of the dam itself, but well beyond that. Hydroelectric energy is massive in the United States and we use it for so many communities communities. But also, again, the drinking water aspect that is, again, very important. And so that's why we need to always be conserving water when we can, because we don't have an unlimited source of water. Some years it rains a whole lot. Some years it rains very little. Some years we have these nasty winters that produce a lot of snow melt. Other years it's relatively dry. All of those things overall impact our water cycle and how that it can be used in situations like these. Just opposite of that water table, we have this, which talks about some of the dredges that they cut into the bottom of the Ohio. And then also some of the things that we source from the water itself. So it's pretty interesting to see this display right here that talks about the river geology and then also the water quality and the fresh water mussels. Diving a bit deeper into the mussel cycle is pretty fascinating because it is an ongoing thing. So you see here, there is a life cycle for a mussel, but also it is surrounded by all of these different kinds of mussels. Whenever I was checking out the murals on that previous upload, there was a whole section that was dedicated to people who would go and pull out the mussels. And at the time they would use them for buttons and things like that. Now we use them for a variety of different things now that are a little bit different, but fascinating to see. And uh, the first time I've ever seen a display about the life cycle of the mussels at any place that I have ever visited. Now, pretty commonly we think of the dams and the water cycle and how all of that factors in, but let's talk about the recreation because a lot of us enjoy the recreational side of just having water nearby. It provides everything from bird watching to swimming, fishing, boating, and even rowing excursions. But there's so much more that goes on within the recreational realm. Now, I love that they highlight this because I think it's important. We see the positives of all the things that water can do for us, but also within these paragraphs, as you kind of read through, it shows what you can do for water. And it might sound silly to say that, but you do have an impact. For example, fishing. It is greatly impacted by pollution. So just picking up your things and throwing them away instead of chunking them off the side of the boat or even taking your things to be recycled as opposed to them ending up in a landfill somewhere. Those things do in fact impact your water and thus your recreational enjoyment of fishing and thus your recreational enjoyment of eating, which ultimately comes from fishing. <laughs> also though, there's a few other things. We wanna also make sure that we acknowledge the dangers and risks of swimming. 
because there are also safety things. So following the rules, making sure you're in areas that you're allowed to be in. The same goes for you independently voting. If you're voting in a place that you're not supposed to, you're putting yourself and others in danger. So we do have an impact on not only the things that we talked about before with like the water and the energy on how we kind of handle things, but we also do on our fun stuff. So we have to do the best that we can to make sure we're doing our part. Oh wow, look at this room. This room is interesting. It's a little darker in here, but I don't know if you can see this. This is a piece of shifted land that looks like it's tilted to the side, kind of. And then we have this boardwalk area and a lot of historic photos. What are these photos of? These are photos of the flood of 1937. It was at this time that they said it was one of the largest floods ever experienced. In fact, this was Paducah and all of the areas that look like they're just like white areas, that's actually floodwaters from above. That's what they look like in photos that were a little bit older. But to give you a bit more of a contextual visual, look at this. People were literally boating through the now historic downtown area. You can see all of the flooded areas and zones right here. This is crazy to see. Some of these buildings are huge buildings and their first floor is almost completely covered in water. That is, wow, that's crazy to see. It says that today the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers works in concert with state and local governments to build flood controls as a result of things like this that once happened. In fact, as a result of this and several other areas that were affected, Congress passed a Flood Control Act. And that Flood Control Act helped to appropriate $24.8 million worth of aid to building levees and flood walls, which is why we see many of the things that we currently do in areas that are at higher risk of flooding today. It is wild to know that it had to come down to something like this. It says on these things right here that are kind of telling us a little bit more that hundreds of people lost their lives as a result of this. Hundreds of people. But in addition to hundreds of lives lost, approximately $400 million in property damage. Can you imagine $400 million in 1937? Just to kind of give you an idea of how big the river swelled, it was over seven miles across at Paducah. And two million cubic feet of water were passing by every single second. Now flooding still does happen today. However, it is controlled considerably compared to what it once was. There were no precautions or measures in place at that time. So it was a total devastation. In addition to the flood itself, flu and typhoid went rampant because there was nothing else they could do and they were kind of in a really bad spot with this and as a result this was made an example to not do this in the future and immediate progress had to be made to change all of it here you can also find the full timeline which started on january 1st and went all the way to february 22nd it took that long before floodwaters started to finally recede 90% of the community was covered. Not just covered, like covered. These last few photos show you a little bit more of the devastation. And it explains that this was considered the most tragic flood in all of the Ohio River Valley history. Now that room was amazing. Um, the representation of the flood and how they shared its story and how they depicted how it rains and it continues to go and how they said that the land and the water ask for your respect. When they don't get it, it will command it. That is powerful. That visual right there explains so much of what we need to learn from the water. That's for sure. Now, as we enter into this next area, we are looking at some of the captains. This is leading us up to something very exciting, which is just around this corner, but let's check out some of the captains first. Here we find some of the captains that were 
present during various points in history. And traditionally we think of the captains as men. However, there is one particular captain right here that was from the Louisville area. Her name was Captain Mary Miller. And she was the daughter of a steamboat engineer and she was born in 1846. In addition to being able to read a little bit more, you can also tap on one of the captains here on the digital pad. You know I like a good digital display. Now on our way to something very special that I was telling you about, there's a couple more displays right here. This one is about the Civil War. And some of those boats that we were talking about, those ironclads and some of those gunner boats, very much so a part of this display. Let me, let me show you a few of these like details. They have some of the ammunition that they might have used and also some just really fascinating pictures. Here are some cannonballs. It says these were used in a Confederate gun. And then also beside that, we have a steamboat training whistle. Again, this is one you're gonna have to come and check out because there is definitely a uh, timeline and a few dates in here that you're going to want to learn more about the overall story of Fort Henry and the Battle of Belmont and then the Federals occupying Paducah. And look at these ships that they have. These things are interesting to say the least. And then this last display before we go and do the super special thing is actually about the restoration story of this particular building. Now, it's kind of fascinating to see that they've left the bones of this, so to speak, so we could see inside and get kind of an idea as to what it would have been like. But also, they have some photos of what it looked like during the process. Now, I'm gonna kind of give you a brief walkthrough right now so you can see what the museum looks like in its entirety. But then, I'm gonna show you these photos so you can see what it looked like before. It is definitely a much different space now than it once was. And I have to say, I love every single thing that they have done with this. They've made it a quality education center for each person who is coming here. They've provided tons of great things for learning about the river and the people of the river. I absolutely appreciate that they took this old building and they turned it into something shiny and new through a lot of hard work. Now look at this, this. This is the part that I was telling you about that was left exposed. Now the River Heritage Museum is actually located within the only surviving antebellum or French before war building in Paducah's commercial district. So this is very significant. This is known as the Petter Building. And this is a two story double pile brick structure that was built around 1843. Now it has served in many capacities for the city of Paducah, but one of the first things that it actually did was it was a hotel. So it kind of makes sense that it was right here on the river and it was a two story building. So that, that totally makes sense. But yeah, I, I love that they have done that and that they have kept some of the historic building alive. A lot of times whenever buildings go into disrepair, they are simply discarded and thought, oh, we can just build something newer, stronger and better. But preserving a piece of our past is important because then we get to learn not only from the wonderful museum itself but also the building and the stories that it has to tell. Coast Guard, would you like the fast boat or the slow boat? Um, let's see. I probably need something slow. Uh, okay. <laughs> That'd be the tow boat. We'll see if you can get under the bridge. Okay. Day or night and then push start. Okay. So okay guys, our goal is to make it under the bridge. I picked the slowest boat because I felt like I might have a better chance of doing this. 
Just call me Captain Bunny. I totally did it. I'm so proud of myself. That was super, super fun and something that is also included in your price of admission. You get to pick from a variety of different boats, the speeds that you want to be going. It's just super, super fun. So Captain Bunny, yes I am. Okay guys, that was the River Discovery Center here in Paducah, Kentucky. I had a blast just exploring through the different parts of history and also becoming Captain Bunny along the way. Now it is raining so this was a perfect rainy day activity because it's completely and totally inside but you could also have fun here on a beautiful sunny amazing day as you walk along the walls of Paducah and make it a full experience. I hope you've enjoyed coming along with me and getting a few new brain wrinkles. Remember we are not here for a long time but we are here for a good time and sometimes learning something super super cool like this is definitely that. Till next time guys, bye!